lot of new names coming out on the Nogi scene here, and it's time for the Grappling Bulletin to dissect some of the biggest news stories and results from the last weekend from around the world of Jiu-Jitsu. Myself, Howell Teague, Chase Smith, and Corey Stockton. Oh, break it down. Let's start off. We're going to talk about the recent Emerald City Invitational event. Pretty fun. 10K, winner takes all, eight-man tournament, lightweight bracket. Uh, what stood out to you, first of all, Chase? I mean, it was a really high-paced uh, event, right? A lot of great undercard matches as well. But for me, what I really like about Emerald City in general is their commitment to kind of tweaking the format, the rule set, right? They cut it down from a 16-man bracket to an 8-man bracket. They also included the recently discussed Mollywop rule, which never came into play as far as I know. They didn't But the to. fact that it was uh, available is great. So credit to those guys for finding their product and making a really fun show. But as far as what stood out, I mean, to me was it was, as one of the announcers said, you know, upset city right a lot of the favorites in that division kind of fell much earlier than we would have ever expected uh Corey, you were on the ground you know what was the vibe like how did you how did you feel about the event yeah the the energy was great i really all of the from the super fights from the undercard fights into the main card super fights and of course the eight man bracket uh everybody was, was coming and attacking and keeping that open uh style that we come to expect from the ebi rules format right so let's talk about the winner the overall winner kieran kitchuk man of the hour the canadian black belt not the biggest of names now he's been on our radar for about the last year or so he really broke through into uh into the scene for me at the nogi pans in 2021 in dallas texas and <clears throat> he didn't even hit the podium that particular day i don't believe but he had a series of matches. A third. There you go. Corey's holding up his finger. How many fingers? Third. <laughs> there you go. Three. So he hit third in the podium. I want to say in the lightweight division. And looked fantastic. Hit a bunch of subs all in a row. And I was like, who is this guy? And he's been kind of floating around since then. You know? He's one of those guys that uh, we've been keeping our eye on. But this is by far his biggest result and something of a breakout moment. Now, a little about Kieran before we start. He's Canadian but now based in training with Team Lloyd Irvin. And um, for anybody who's watched him compete, this guy's a sub hunter. He's a finisher. That's right. And it's worth noting that he punched his ticket for this Emerald City by winning the, the trials competition they held a few months ago. So, uh, you know, like you said, he's been kind of building his brand, building the momentum for a while. People that have been really dialed in the competition scene know him, but this, uh, as you said, a, a breakout moment and did it in style with some wins over big names like, you know, Johnny Grippo, Josh Cisneros, and Adam Benyon. Let's roll this highlight video. We can uh, look at some of his uh, his best moments uh, as we're kind of talking about the jujitsu. And, <clears throat> excuse me, I think what we'll do is we'll start off, we'll just talk about the matches as he had them in order. So this is Kitchuk against Joshua Cisneros. Now, it is not, uh, it is not an insult to say that Kitschuk was not a favorite, not even a front runner coming into this division because you had four very high seeds in each of the corners of the bracket. You had Gianni Grippo, who won the last Emerald City tournament. You had Joshua Cisneros. You had John Calstein and Gabriel Souza. Kitschuk came in as, as you said, Chase, he won the trials, the qualifier event, the uh, finishers uh, only event to punch his ticket onto this one. And he looked phenomenal. So even though he was technically an underdog, he looked great. And right now we're watching him against Gianni Grippo, going head to head with Gianni Grippo in the 50-50 in the leg game. Not many people can uh, can do that and not get their back taken. But Corey, you were on the ground, you were mat side, you had a better look than anybody as to what Kira's jujitsu was like. Just describe for us what really stands out about him as a competitor. Yeah, he is incessant from the guard with his false reap attacks especially, but he has a really, you can kind of watch as, as he's playing. He's got a system in his head starting with the false reap and going through a bunch of a bunch of leg attacks. And when he gets to the back, the one thing that stood out to me was what he, he was winning in overtime because he was using his, uh, his half Nelson from back control, really shutting the guy's escapes down and then getting his submission from there. So really kind of intelligent guard, intelligent back control game um, and just uh, a fast pace and uh, sets a lot of his attack his attacks up off off balances like this so what I'd like to point out as well is <clears throat> excuse me exactly as it says at the bottom of the screen right there that Kieran Kitchuk submitted all three of his opponents in the EBI overtime rounds because there were no submissions in any of the regulation rounds in the tournament I think that speaks more to the level of competition in this event. It was very, very close. And these lightweight matches, sometimes, you know, I think the margins are just so slim. So 
it went to, you know, a lot of these, all these matches were decided in overtime rounds. But Kitschuk is the only person to submit every single opponent. And that stands out because generally, Chase, generally, when we're watching EBI rounds, so many matches are decided on the fastest escape or the longest riding time, however you want to look at it. Mm -hmm. It's rare to see somebody hit uh, consistent submissions like that. Yeah, you know, and some of that speaks to the fact that a lot of these athletes, um, maybe not so much now, but maybe a few years ago when EBI was like the premier show, they would work these scenarios every single day, right? And that's something that actually that New Wave does and that the guys with B team do is that they drill, uh, you know, back escapes, back attacks, controlling the positions. Uh, so when they get there, they are so at home, right? I mean, every high-level athlete should be, but when you go against somebody that is doing that every day for 30 minutes to an hour besides a normal training routine, uh, it shows why it'd be so hard to finish that person. It's worth noting too, by the way, we're talking, uh, of course, about our champ, Karen Kachuk, quite a bit, but uh, our silver medalist, Adam Benayoun, oh, yeah. again, another kind of dark horse in this bracket, took out Gabriel Souza and John Calistine on his way to the final. So um, That's a big deal. That, that's pretty exciting, right, to see see things get shaken up like that. Well, the whole point yeah. of the title of today's show is this new wave of no-gi grapplers, and that's exactly yeah. what we yeah. saw right there. So four favorites didn't make it into the final, you know? Two of them fell in the opening round. The next two, they got stopped in the semifinals. So we literally have seen two. <laughs> it's kind of a, a backhanded compliment to call Kira and, and Adam, you know, brand new faces, because they're certainly not. They've been floating around. But again, a breakout moment for these guys. Mm. So this is the new wave. This is the new wave of Nogi grapplers that we're seeing in action, right? It's true. Adam, Adam Benny got a black belt. Like a, a while ago, I think. Oh, yeah. No, he's been around. He's been around a long time. Uh, I want to say maybe like five years or yeah, something like yeah. that. But it, it, you're right. We should, you know, Kitschuk deserves to shine for winning this. But absolutely, Adam Benyon as well looked fantastic. Uh, hit a submission against Gabriel Souza in the uh, in the overtime rounds in the opening match. And then uh, I believe it was fastest ri escape time or, or riding time, we should say, uh, against Calistine. Correct, Corey? Correct. Yeah, it was uh, it was ride time by a narrow margin. I want to see something like five seconds. But against Calistine, that's an eternity. He's one of the best out there in, in uh, back control escapes or in, in EBI OT. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the commentators uh, reference that constantly about how good John is in, in those overtime rounds. And they're not kidding. They're re he really is uh, fantastic. So it, it's, for me, it's always refreshing to, to watch this kind of new talent, you know, come through. And this is one of my favorite things about watching the recent events that we had, the ADCC East Coast trials, the ADCC South American trials, um, that we saw so many new faces coming through. Right from 16-year-old Cole Abate to you know guys like Giancarlo Baldoni, uh, these guys making it through and qualifying for ADCC. They're not the biggest of names, but this is an opportunity now. You can see them kind of like chipping away and disrupting the status quo. And for me, that's a great thing. For me, that is a really healthy thing about the sport because every sport undergoes generational change. Right? Athletes' careers are short. Mm -hmm. High performance mm -hmm. window is short. So. It's it's normal to see new faces come through, but I love watching it happen. Yeah, and maybe it's a, a slightly different conversation, but I think this also speaks to the the level of commitment to no gi competition that we've seen in the newer generation, where, where they're identifying that as the professional scene. Something Jacob Couch talks about in his recent interview. Um, we'll see a bit of later, but by making that commitment and jump, they are narrowing the gap between their skill level between some of the more established black belts and their own trajectory because they haven't split their time so much with the gi uh, as some of these other guys might have throughout the last let's say decade we've so, seen a lot more uh specialists specialists nowadays, it, you aren't know we? Yeah. It's, it's just it's just uh it's the preferred route to maybe make make a living out of jiu-jitsu at the moment you know i'm hoping that the gi catches up as i love the gi but where the money is right now, it's definitely trending towards no-gi competition. And speaking of no-gi competition, there was uh, Emerald City on the weekend. There was also uh, Eddie Bravi Invitational that returned the welterweight tournament in uh, in Mexico. Alan Sanchez of 10th Planet winning that one. Um, but it, it Emerald City drew, I feel, some unfair criticism. Not necessarily the event itself. It's more the results of the matches that drew the criticism. Because as always, and once again, the EBI rules and the overtime and the way that people win those matches, it it sparks a fierce debate every mm. single time mm. that some people just don't believe it's fair to be given your opponents back. They don't believe it's fair to 
to dominate a match for, let's say, 10 minutes, and then that opponent gets gifted your back. Now, you mentioned there the Wally, the Molly Womp rule, which is something that Zach Maslany, Jim Holland, and the officiating crew at Finishers Institute, it's their, of course, 10th Planet Gym in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and they run the Finishers uh, series, and, and they introduced this rule, and it's basically if you got dominated in the regulation round, they're not even going to go to overtime because you were considered to have been beaten so badly that you haven't earned it. And therefore, you don't get given the opportunity to choke your opponent from the back, which I think is a really good development. And it remains to be seen whether uh, other events will adopt this. But, Corey, it is important to note that this rule was in effect at Emerald City, but it never even got close to being applied in this scenario, right? Right. We didn't see we didn't see any matches get called uh, a Molly Womp, and I don't think there there really were very very many matches that were close, um, because all it takes from from the other side is a legitimate looking attack, some form of offense. As long as one person is not entirely dominated, this rule isn't in effect. The other thing we didn't see, um, which I think we can talk about a little bit, is uh, no stalling was called. So this match, unlike a lot of EBI rules, uh, rules events we've seen, this tournament had stalling in play. Uh, they had a, a yellow card system. Um, we didn't see any of that either. Now, um, wait there a second, because we got a comment here from No Strings in our YouTube chat saying that he felt Kieran got dominated by Cisneros and it shouldn't have gone to overtime. Now, Cisneros hit a couple of really, really nice entries to the black hole, right? Kind of using that deep underhook to, to throw himself up into an attacking position. Do you feel that those attacks were enough to warrant a molly womp? I mean, there's the idea that, that it, it seems that people are straying towards it. If you lost the decision in that regulation round, then you shouldn't go to the overtime. But what do you think? So uh, according to the way it, it looks like it was it refereed, had Josh used that very first black hole entry, which he hit in the first three or four seconds of the match, and maintained Kieran's back, different story but because kieran was able to escape the attacks of josh twice and then got up and started to maybe not effectively but work his passing it wasn't an entire domination kieran had you maybe some form of control of the match or was able to at least escape and play his own game i think um another match we saw in the undercard J Jaden mueller's match that was a a, a really good argument mm. for the molly Wap rule i thought that could have been called there uh, went to overtime and Jaden got the, the finish i think right away but um yeah, to me, I, I think if you escape a position and are able to enact some kind of strategy, there is the argument that you should be allowed in this format to go on. But if you just get dominated positionally, never get out, then yeah, that, I mean, that seems like that would be the case. I like how they're still, they're working as you say, it, tweaking it, developing the rules, playing with it, trying to refine it. I think that's a great move, you know. Uh, Eddie Bravo, Invitational Rules, CPI Rules have always been controversial. They've always drawn criticism from... Sometimes fans, sometimes competitors, sometimes both. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it's a healthy debate to have, right? It, it absolutely is. But um, in a tournament this high level, I think it's uh, matches are always going to be close, you know, even on who's number one. How many split decisions have we had? How many matches have we had where it's very, very difficult to call a clear winner? So, you know, every rule format is a little bit different. Uh, every event has its peculiarities. But, um, yeah, I, I'm not a... I don't hate EBI rules like some people do. They say it's like it's the antithesis of jujitsu that it, you know you should never be gifted a, 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 an advantageous position mm -hmm. on your back. But you listen to Eddie Bravo's rationale, you know, way back when he explained how he came up with it. It's like you know instead of a golden score based off a takedown or a pin, it's in effect it's a golden score based off a submission. It's a shootout. Yeah, yeah. For me, I, you know, I don't hate EBI, and I think that actually the Molly Wap really resolves a lot of problems uh, potentially. I know it's not necessarily involved in. The actual EBI tournament quite yet. Not yet. Not yet, but maybe, maybe, it maybe it will take it on. But um, for me, I, I actually think the the challenge of getting to that position is like one of the most exciting parts of jiu-jitsu. Uh, and the finish comes as a, as a result of that first necessary step. So I, I do tend to glaze over just a little bit <laughs> when overtime starts. And it's like, okay, here we go, overtime. See, I'm the opposite. Because yeah. sometimes when the overtime starts, that's when I get locked in because mm. I'm like, okay, there's a very strong chance that we could see a finish here. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if it is a I really... I hope so. That's the whole right. point of that. Exactly. You know? But if it's a but, really even match, yeah. sometimes I find my attention wandering because I'm like, ah, there's no way they're going to finish each other. I'm just going to, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll look back in a couple mm -hmm. minutes when we get to the to the shootout. And, and I don't hate it. it. And actually, I think it's, it's worth saying, you know, a lot of people in, in the past have said that 
the fact that grappling has 25 different rule sets is a problem, right? But I think actually there is a benefit because you can, A, as a competitor, work on various um, technical scenarios, like dial in those, those skills. But as a viewer, you can really find what you're looking for. Yeah, something right? for everyone. So yeah. uh, I, I don't dislike that it exists, but it's definitely not my favorite. There you go. That's why you can then choose it, to watch something you else. Asked. I think exactly. you asked, right? So. I did. <laughs> so uh, that's a. It's an interesting debate, as we said, you know. And I think it's a perfect segue to to, to talk about rules in jujitsu elsewhere that are currently undergoing some changes. So BJJ stars in Brazil, the best pro event in Brazil. Really good event. You can watch the last couple here on Flow Grappling. We have the archives and stuff. All the big names from Brazil will appear on this show and they bring in international talent as well. Very high level performance uh, event. But uh, I think that they have broken some real new ground here because they've unveiled some of the, I don't know, harshest, I suppose is a way to describe it. Definitely uh, a bold move here because they've instituted some new anti-stalling rules that I think people have been crying out for. Mm not just the fans, but the competitors as well. Mm -hmm. And just to explain what these, uh, what this anti-stalling rules are, they're trying to eliminate stalling in either the lapel guard or the 50-50 guard, two of the most hated positions in all of sport jujitsu. And it's like I said, it's a bold move. And I feel that the word here, they're looking to do combat anti jiu-jitsu correct chase yeah and I, I think it's worth defining what they actually have put in place right so right. so the lapel guard thing is a little bit not unclear but up to interpretation by the judges they say you can right. be in a lapel guard whether it's squid worm whatever you have as long as you're being offensive with that movement then they'll let you continue if you are not if you are deemed to be stalling and holding whatever yeah. um they will reset the position with the passer standing on the feet with no grips. no grips for the person who is now just seated in seated guard, no grips. So that's a long ways away from where they were with the lapel, right? And you're right. It yeah. is totally open to interpretation because looking at it, the, 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 sort of the, the phrase, the translation that we looked at uh, basically says inactivity or passivity. So mm -hmm. that is very much open to interpretation. And then there's the 50-50. This Again, is much more clear cut in, it is. in this case. The rule about this states that 20 seconds of inaction will result in a standing restart and a penalty against both competitors. And now, this clip right here is from BJJ Stars. This is from uh, Urban Santos versus Eric Moniz. And this match, they spent four and a half minutes stuck in the 50-50 guard. That is about the worst possible thing you could ever hope to watch as a fan of jiu-jitsu. As a competitor, nobody wants to spend four and a half minutes stuck in the same position. Absolutely awful, interminable for both the viewer and the person on the mat. Nobody's happy with that. So this is a perfect example of why BJJ stars are introducing mm. this new rule. And man, you look at the people who responded to this. Mm -hmm. The post, when they dropped the news on their Instagram page, uh, man, the, they, they came out. Leandro Lowe, Roberto Jimenez, excuse me, Leandro Lowe, Shanji Hibero, Mateus Gabriel, Bia Mosquita, Fabricio Andre, Leo Vieira. Many, many big names mm. were so quick to say about time. And... I don't disagree with them. I think it's a very good move. Yeah, you know, it's it's difficult from one hand, uh, on one hand rather, because you don't ever want to limit what competitors can do, right? You don't want to take it out of their hands and penalize them. But if if the Gi wants to make a comeback from a spectator's viewpoint to what Nogi has to offer these days, there has to be a way to push the action forward. And what we see in lapel guard and 50-50 is two of the most inactive positions in jiu-jitsu right and uh, it's not that they're not effective but no. it, it's a, the for the for the viewership experience they are very very tough to watch and, and Corey, so, i think yeah. that you mentioned something a while ago which always stuck with me is it about how you felt that the the no gi and the gi games require very different approaches to the rules right do you remember what you said you had a great phrase yes yeah, so something to the effect that in nogi, the best rule sets are the most hands off, right? The the least limitations, the the least um, restrictions on what an athlete can or can't do. Whereas in the gi, I I think uh, the 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 gi for it to be spectator friendly requires more rules because there's so many ways to game the grips. And for example, like you look at judo, the Gregorian grip, the belt grip, 
you have to use that in a certain time. If you look at wrestling, right, locked hands, you have to use that in a certain amount of time. I think the more gi jiu-jitsu institutes some restrictions on the amount at which a grip or a specific position can be used, the more fan friendly it will be. Hmm. We've we've seen so many matches that have stalemated because people have been stuck in a position and somebody uh, they can't necessarily open their guard, they can't escape for fear of, you know, compromising their, themselves to an attack or counter attack and the top guy can't move while he's stuck in that position, literally has to wait for his opponent to, to, to open but it's a, you know, as I said, a classic stalemate. We've seen that happen again and again and again. The entire time that I've worked here at Flow Grappling, I've seen it with high level names like Marcus Bouchesha, I've seen it with Bruno Malfacini, I've seen it with so many really talented, skillful grapplers who have just been locked into certain positions in a match. And the referees, their directive is not to interfere mm -hmm. unless it is a blatant infraction of the rules, i.e. one person is really not trying to do anything. But sometimes the position it's not that it couldn't be used to attack. And this is, this is the, the difference here, I feel, in this inter interpretation. That they're looking for intention behind the position. You've got to be using it to improve your position to attack. And simply holding is not enough, right? Yeah, I think it, it couldn't be clearer in, in both the 50-50 and the lapel guards. For me, um, who knows if this is the perfect solution, but I'm really glad that someone is trying because... I think anybody that's trained has had this conversation, right? Like, well, how do we how do we address it? What do we do? And we all come up with some ideas. Do we ban the positions? Do we put up time limits? Whatever. But we haven't seen it in action, right? So now we're going to see how these athletes respond to the new format. Maybe we'll see some adjustments from I BJ so. Stars. Yeah. Um, but I'm super excited to watch it unfold because I think it, it's necessary, right? The, like I said just a moment ago, for for the gi to become. Uh, spectator friendly sport there has to be a little more action and th those are the two strategies that really really slow things down and I, I get why they're used because they work and they win but if they no longer are able to do so maybe we'll see a better overall viewing experience well we'll uh, be able to see it tested out pretty soon because BJJ stars the next event is on April 30th it's a middleweight GP featuring so far, four announced athletes as an eight-man bracket, and so far they've announced Leandro Lowe, Roberto Jimenez, Leo Lara, and Mauricio Oliveira. More athletes, TBA. There are also a handful of super fights on there, including Bia Mesquita and other big names. And I'm looking forward to that one. April 30th here, live on Flow Grappling. Real quick, too. I, I just want to say, because I like the lapel guard <laughs> uh, in the various forms, they're not saying it's banned, right? You can, it's you not can, banned. You can be active in that position. You right. just can't hang out. So I think right. that that's... I'm a little nervous because it is up to interpretation and like, okay, how do, how does that actually look? You know, like time, like, or does it come down to time? Does it not? But in any case, I'm glad that position is still allowed and that it's up to the athlete to make it look like they're doing something. Now, right. could that be gamed? Maybe. We'll Maybe. see. Maybe. Yeah. But. Yeah. All right. Let's move on, shall we? Because uh, we saw this one coming. We saw this news coming a while ago. But big news is that the Rural Total Brothers signed a contract with one championship for both grappling and mixed martial arts. Now, it was no secret that the Rotolo brothers have had their eye on competing in MMA. This is something that we've known for a while. In fact, it's simply a case of when, not if. But they've signed this deal with one championship, a non-exclusive deal, that they're going to compete in both grappling matches and ultimately, hopefully, by the end of 2020, They'll be at uh, 2022. They'll be competing in uh, in MMA as well. I imagine probably post ADCC. But this is a clip from inside the gym of the Rotolo brothers because we got to see them sparring inside the Atos gym, and they're not the only grapplers who have been signed recently by one championship. Both now Ty and Cade, as you can see here, Cade have been signed, but they join in Mikey Musumichi, Andre Galvao, Daniel Kelly, and of course Gordon Ryan. Now don't forget that. Gary Tonan started his one championship MMA career with a grappling match against Shinyoki and then went on to compete uh, a number of times before uh, having a shot at the one lightweight title. So this is just <laughs> this video right here. It goes to show that these kids have been fighting since day one. And then in, uh, in the ring or on the streets or in the hotel room, they love to scrap. They love to throw down. And this is hopefully what we can expect for them when they fight later this year. But 
it's a, it's not a surprise, but I'm excited about this prospect, right? <laughs> this clip makes me laugh. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm thrilled, right? Like you, you, as you said, it's no surprise that that they're eyeing MMA and that they've been signed at this point. Um, their future is super bright in whatever combat sport they choose to go into, in my opinion. So. It's it's really exciting. I, I do think you're right that ADCC could be one of the last major uh, grappling camps that we see these guys in, and then they might change over completely to MMA. I and, hope they don't, and then do a little grappling on the yeah, side. Yeah, I was right? gonna say. Yeah, I yeah. hope they don't leave grappling completely. I hope they bounce back and forth between the two. You know, mm -hmm. it'd be heartbreaking to lose them because these guys they are you know so talented and such fun to watch. But I mean, I just think they're built for it, right? They, you can just look at them. They want to scrap. They yeah, want to fight. And I think they, they've they gotten a taste of, of what the big show feels like at WNO and the promotion that goes in and uh, the fans being there. It's a, a lot different than being in tournaments, right? So, uh, you know, one may offer yet another opportunity to do something like that, so. Yeah. What do you think about this news that, uh, you know, all these grapplers are, uh, a kind of eyeing MMA, right? Because you've got Andre Galvão, who uh, is is competing in a grappling match later this month against uh, Renier de Rida, uh, and he said about how he wants to fight MMA. And there are a number of other people inside the Atos camp. We know they're training MMA. They're all eyeing to fight later this year. What do you think, Corey? Yeah, I, I think as the prof professional scene of, of jiu-jitsu goes more towards no-gi, it makes sense, right? No-gi is a step closer to MMA than, than gi competition is. So I think as we see uh, jiu-jitsu become, I think jiu-jitsu is kind of surging again in, in MMA as well. I, I think jiu-jitsu artists are, are doing well again, maybe not always. Not always, unfortunately. There was a notable top, example of right? that last weekend. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but, but Paul went out for Gary Tolman, yeah. who lost by TKO in his uh, in the first round of his title shot. There, uh, that was a sad moment. But I think you're right. I think you're onto something. That seeing these guys, maybe they're going to be the ones flying the flag for high level grappling skills in the cage, right? Right. It, it is resurging again when we look at what's happening with Buchecha and with Gilbert Burns and with you know all of the uh, all of the recent grappling stars, kind of. It, pointing back in that direction. Yeah, look at that, right? Bouchesha, Gordon Ryan, Andre Galvao, Gary Tonon, Daniel Kelly, Mikey Musumichi, and Ruotolo. I don't imagine we'll ever see Mikey Musumichi do MMA. <laughs> you know, he signed to this development deal and this uh, this grappling deal with those guys. Daniel Kelly could. I think she could do MMA. Uh, Gordon has said that it's not really in his future plans. It's potentially something he may do in the future, but Bouchesha's killing it. Gary has has you know had an amazing run up until challenging for the title. I'm sure he'll bounce back, and I think the Rutolo brothers are going to be just fireworks when they get in the ring. Very excited to see that. So let's uh, let's talk about who's number one. We mentioned Mikey Musumichi because we've got big event coming up. In case you hadn't heard, <laughs> eleven days away, eleven days today. We've got who's number one. Tezos, who's number one, presented by Fat Tire, and the main event, Mikey Musumichi versus Gio Martinez. It's a rematch. Uh, really, I think a highly anticipated rematch. A lot of bad blood still there boiling away. And uh, man, it is a stacked card. Who else we got on the show, Chase? We got some really, we got some big names on this. Man, I mean, I think what everyone's really, really looking forward to is the debut of, of course, Nicholas Marigali. Yes. You may have heard this at home. You know, he uh, left the Gi world, joined up with Danaher and Gordon here in Austin, Texas to really review his. Uh, his skills there in the Nogi arena as it's a brand new thing for him. Yeah, brand new. He's never had a Nogi match <laughs> in his career. He's taken on a Nogi world champion. In How crazy Arnaldo is that? Maidana. So, yeah. That's pretty fire. We have the return of Nikki Ryan taking on Jacob Couch. Uh, it's Pedagos, the mission fighting representative there. Uh, a big test for both athletes. They are both really fired up. We'll hear from actually Jacob Couch in a little bit here. Uh, we have Jesse Crane versus Tammy Musumichi. Tammy's back, and that's that's a class of generations right there. Yes. You know, world champion uh, and basically veteran at this point, Tammy Musumichi taking on. How long has Tammy been a black belt? Like 10 years? <laughs> it's been a minute. At least 2014, right? Wow. Yeah. Exactly. So that's coming up on nine or eight years at this point. And then uh, we have Heisem is back versus Elder Cruz from Checkmat. And then a match that I want to say... Maybe people are sleeping on just a little bit, just a little bit, because there's so many good ones. It's Dante Leon versus Mika Gabao. Oh, no, I'm not sleeping on this one. I'm, I'm not so sleeping excited. either. But yeah. I, there's so many things to get excited about yeah. that I feel like I, I, this could be a main event on other shows. Well, there's so much heat yeah. on this yeah. card. You're right. I mean, you've got the main event, Mikey Gio, but then you've got Dante Mika, you've got Nikki Couch, you've got Jesse Tammy, you've got Merigali versus Arnaldo, you've got on the prelims, you've got Gabriel Souza versus Keith Krikorian. This card is loaded from top to bottom. But you're right. 
I think there was so much attention has gone, rightly so, on the main event and on the Milky debut of Marigali that it is time to talk. It's time to really dive into Dante Leon versus Mika Galvao. I personally am very excited for this. 170 pound match, gonna go down. It's the co main event here. And um, well, you were chopping up some interview clips earlier because Michael and Trey and Simone, our fearless documentary makers of the Daisy Fresh series, they were in Mount Vernon, Illinois last week to you know film some stuff, uh, the preparations for who's number one. Also got ADCC trials around the corner and everybody's training really hard for that. Got some really good training rounds on our site, actually. You can go watch Andrew Wiltsey. His wrestling is incredible, by the way, but lots and lots of good videos on there. And then we are able to talk to the kind of the principal guys about what they thought about the card. And um, Chase, should we should we start off with the Mika versus the Dante match? Yeah, we could do that. Tyler, let's play our second Daisy Fresh clip here. So we had Mikey up first, but yeah, uh, let's go straight to, to Mika's clip here. Mika is fucking good. Dante is really fucking good too. Um, it's sh th that's going to be a how does the match go? Okay, I think I give the advantage to Mika in a scramble. I think just the way his brain works and processes information, he's young. He's young and he doesn't hold anything back at any point on any technique he does. I think uh, uh, Dante's got a lot more experience. I think Dante is much less likely to get tired. Okay, so uh, long match, I give it to Dante. If Dante doesn't get caught in something crazy right away, flying fucking, you know, flying triangles and flying Kimuras and shit, he's, uh, he's good. I think I give it to Dante. It's just going to, you know, we just got to make sure we don't get caught in something quick because that's what Micah is good at. Like, the, the big chance to see how he would do in the big scrambles was the match with Ty Rattulo, and I think they both respected each other so much, they kind of kept the T-Rex arms, and so uh, um, I'm curious to see how Micah will do when, when Dante, you know, turns it up and puts the heat on him. If there's anybody in jiu-jitsu that can do that, it's Dante, you know, he can, he can push the pace. He's, uh, you know, constantly passing. When he's on bottom, he doesn't stay on bottom for long. So I think they're really, really similar in a lot of ways. The difference is, is you know, uh, Dante is the veteran when, when it comes to, uh, you know, who's number one. And, you know, big, big matches. And Dante's been all over the place. So uh, I think, uh, you know, M Mika struggled a little bit in some ways with Oliver Taza. And uh, he got a little bit tired. When you're that explosive and you're, you know, that strong, I think you kind of get tired. So Dante can push the pace even when, the, you know, you don't really see... Dante tired too often, you know what I mean? So I just think uh, the, the the level of, of, of at that weight and the guys are so deep and they're so good, man. I think uh, for me that's the that that's the match of the night. I think that's the one that's gonna you know like like you know like blow people's minds. Dante's pace. He's a really good scrambler. He he can stay really tight, and a lot of Mika's attacks come off of a lot of extension, like the jumping arm bars and his uh, his submission attacks are all really just like. They're really good, man. They just come out of nowhere sometimes, and then he can like set them up. He can change speeds really well. But also, I think Dante, being who he is, at, especially at 170, so powerful, man. He's one of the strongest guys I've ever rolled with in my entire life. So him being who he is, he's like the juggernaut at that weight class. I think he can match Mika's pace. And at 170, I don't think Mika's as strong as he is at 185, and I think Dante comes out on top. So really good insight there from uh, from. So Andrew Wiltsey, Heath Pedigo, and Jacob Couch there. Uh, I mean, everybody can hear the clips themselves, but what did you, what did you make of, of their interpretations of this match? Well, it definitely seems that they're saying it's going to come down to the physicality, right? That, yeah. that Dante's got the gas tank and the power to make things work for him if things get, you know, head to head. Dante is a bruiser. I will say that's a terrifying strategy against someone like Mika Galvao, who clearly right. is extremely powerful, right? Uh, and a sniper. And snipe. I mean, he's got all the tools, right? And right. They, they they know that. They say that up front right there in those interviews that his skills are incredible, and they're hoping that it comes down to maybe an issue of output and power and work rate. I think that's just a scary thing to say when you when you look at Mika's performances. Um, if that's what you're counting on, I haven't seen that kid get tired either. So no, I know Dante is a horse, a workhorse, right? I mean, yes. he, he and he's extremely strong. Uh, has put out more than one instructional on Fanatics on how to do so, if you guys want to check that out. But he, the dude's neck is like this, this big. <laughs> um, the weight class is interesting as well. I liked what... The, uh, the, the cut yeah. to one, from 185 to 170 is interesting, but I wonder if it is as relevant as they think, given right. Mika's recent performance at Trials, which was at 77 kilos or 170. Well, good point, because we saw Mika do 30 minutes straight against Tyru Tolo at the Who's Number One Championships at 185 mm -hmm. last September. 
and he competed at 170 at the ADCC trials. But he finished all of his matches, five matches in a row, I think, five matches. In five uh, total minutes. In five minutes, exactly, <laughs> yeah. I guess just... he didn't test his gas tank. Right, that's my point. So, okay, he made the cut, he said he felt great. He looked great, he finished everybody super quick, but it is a good question. How is it going to affect his stamina as an endurance? Because it's definitely a factor. What do you think of it? If if Dante, if Dante's plan is to push Mika and to to break his gas tank, he's gonna have to figure out how to push Mika without getting caught, right? Because right. Mika's very mm. good at, at, as a counterfighter, and anybody who's gonna try and bully him is gonna put themselves at risk. So he uh, loves people going at him. Right? I, I think if that's if that's, that's Dante's strat strategy, he's gonna have to think very hard about how to do that without putting himself in constant jeopardy for 15 minutes. Great point. But also something that Andrew Wilsey said, right? He said that what they have to focus on is not getting caught out immediately. That Mika's mm. extremely quick and explosive and, and has a penchant for finishing matches in an instant. I think the the sentiment there is that we got to survive that early onslaught. Mika's going to show him some stuff very Take early, very quickly, yeah. and then drag it out. So that's why I'm excited because they expect Mika to come out guns blazing as they should, and they think that the grit of Dante will be enough to carry him through. I mean, that's a that's a great kind of stylistic bout that we're looking at there. Ah, I'm I'm into it. I I can't wait to see it. I think it's going to be a great match. Dante versus Mika is going to be the uh, is the the co-main event, and oh, I think it's time to talk about the main event because the Daisy Fresh boys also gave us their insight on Mikey versus Gio. And I think just as is the case with Dante versus Mika, Dante is representing Pedigo submission fighting nowadays. So of course, they're going to lean towards Dante in their assessments. And Mikey also joined Pedigo submission fighting just October of last year. Uh, and again, I'm sure that they're going to favor their teammates, but... Well, should we roll this clip and, and hear what they have to say? Yeah, let's hear it from them themselves. Let's go kick things off here with Heath. I think it's a it's a good uh, it's a good match for Mikey, you know, in like every way possible. I, I don't really see how he can lose the match. Um, I think that he's uh, d dominant in every aspect, of, including the wrestling. I think that Mikey's even a better wrestler than him. Uh, Gio's great, and I think uh, that. Um, you know, it's uh, I can see why he wants to get the rematch. He was, you know, pretty much completely dominated in the first one. He just didn't get finished. So, uh, but I think this match, I think Mikey will finish this time. I think it's he'll just get on his back, and I think he's gonna choke him out. What do you mean? That's not a matchup. It's a free win for Mikey. All right. Mikey so, already beat Gio yeah, easily, yeah. and he dominated him every possible. I like Gio. I think Gio's fantastic, but I think you're comparing different classes of competitor between the two. They're not in the same class at all. I expect. Uh, a little bit soon. I think Mikey will get to finish this time, obviously. Uh, Gio is incredible, but I just think Mikey is, man, I, when I was, I, I trained with Mikey a few times and we've got to sit and talk about jiu-jitsu and exchange some ideas and things like that. And he is just different. He just thinks differently. He's on a different scale than other people about jiu-jitsu and about the way he processes information. So uh, with that being said, like, He's, he's pretended to let me show him a few things sometimes to make me feel good about myself, and I'm very grateful for that. But the, 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 the rate he takes the things that he pretends to learn from me is incredible, man. Like, he starts showing me things about stuff I've worked on forever and things I, I thought I knew about. So I think Mikey's going to come out, the same thing, attack the submission the whole time, and eventually get the finish. I gotta say, all of us kind of chuckled as Jacob said that there about how Mikey lets him show him some things sometimes that he already knows. But, uh, that's, that's amazing. And I, man, I'd love to be a fly in the wall for that training session. Yeah, you know, my, Mikey's so cerebral. Um, everybody knows it, right? And so putting him in uh, sort of the pressure cooker that's Daisy Fresh has got to be an experience, right? Because that, that room is not only just technical, but known for extremely hard work. Intense. So, yeah, intense. Um, quite the range there of, of assessments of that match, right? We have yeah. Jacob talking about the technical implications of the matchup, Andrew just saying Mikey's on another level, and then we have Heath who boldly proclaims that Mikey might be a better wrestler. So I feel like there's a lot of different things coming at us from that, and that we have a lot to expect from Mikey, apparently. Yeah, I mean, there's no question at all that you know Mikey is uh, a supreme technician, as uh, as Couch describes. But Corey, what did you make of Andrew's statements? Because I think of all of them, he was the most 
Uh, well, he held nothing back in his assessment, right? Andrew Wilty rarely holds <laughs> holds something back, especially when he can uh, when he can make a, a punchy statement. So not not exactly unexpected from him, but definitely bold nonetheless. Ah, I'm uh, I'm looking forward to it, and uh, I, I think that we should have some uh, some clips. Actually, if you go to the site right now, and if you scroll down uh, about a page or so, just below the Who's Number One vlogs, you will find a collection of interview clips from Gio Martinez, who has fired back with plenty of comments about uh, Mikey Musumichi and a little bit of everything on their beef, on how he thinks the rematch will go, uh, describes Mikey's jujitsu, um, his assessment of the first time that they faced off, a little bit of everything. You can go check that out. And um, of course, coming up on March 25th, Tezos Who's Number One, presented by Fat Tire. But we also have more live events coming up on Flow Grappling soon. ADCC West Coast Trials goes down Las Vegas, April 2nd and 3rd. It is official. This is going to be the biggest ADCC trials in history. Any trials, any qualifying event ever, this is going to be far and away the biggest. It is absolutely insane how many people have signed have up. Have they capped any of the divisions yet? Hell, I know they're. Yes. The, which, which ones? 256 is the limit for the 77 and possibly I think we might be approaching that so on the 66 crazy. division oh as well. God. That means eight matches to win goals. Yeah, wow. That's a long weekend. Hope those uh, fellas cardio's in, in good, good state. <laughs> they need to be. Man, whoever wins this has definitely earned this spot. And as we discussed last week, I think that whoever wins the North American trials definitely should be seeded appropriately because these are the deepest and the most difficult trials you could possibly hope to compete in in the world. We'll be streaming it all live. You can watch every match, every mat right here on Flow Grappling. I'm very excited to see who's going to come out of that as a champion. And then the following weekend, right now, state the tentative start date. It's either April 5th or 6th. That has uh, yet to be confirmed because registration is still open for the IBJJF Pan Championships going down in Kissimmee, Florida, just, so just outside of Orlando. And um, we are pretty much back to the old IBJJF calendar now. Mm. Europeans kicks off the year, then Pans, then Brazilian Nationals in May, and then June as uh, the World Championships. That's just around the corner. This, uh, this first half of the year was always dedicated to the Gi season. And uh, the PANS has historically always been a major event, second only to the Worlds in terms of prestige and uh, in terms of difficulty to win it as well. So excited to see uh, some names already signed up for the PAN Championship. So we were looking at the divisions earlier there and I'm particularly excited already for the uh, light feather and the featherweight divisions. Um, the names have started trickling in and uh, the featherweight's looking good. You've got Kennedy Maciel, you've got Sam Nagai, you've got some really exciting, talented grapplers coming through on this one. So uh, registration's still open. We're expecting to see plenty more come through uh, very soon. But uh, yeah, we'll have more updates as we get them. It's pretty Sounds much good. it from today's show, right? Anything else we want to leave with? No, I hope you all have a good week. We'll be back uh, the following Monday. See you next time.